new announcement to the regular worshipers here at Pleasant Hill. But after 70 years, uh, I'm being moved to a different appointment. And I promised I would tell you where I was going. I didn't know last week, and I found out this week. Uh, it's that way with us Methodists, is it not? We, uh, we, we tend to come, and then we tend to go. Uh, the, uh, after really 39 years in local pastoral ministry, serving a church, uh, the district superintendent, for some unknown reason, decided that I would be better off kicked upstairs. And so I'm going to be working with the district, the Ubari district, uh, helping to mentor young pastors as they come in as a, I don't know if you've ever looked into the eyes of a young, brand new pastor. It's kind of look, like looking at the dome, looking in the headlines. You know. uh, young pastors have a lot of ambition, they have a lot of energy, and uh, they need some guidance because they have no clue what to do next. And, and that's really going to be my job is to kind of come alongside and be a helper to, uh, to those who are mentoring others. Uh, the title is about that long, and I couldn't even pronounce it if I began to say it. So uh, that's what I'm going to be doing. And uh, appreciate your prayers, not just for me. Uh, after four years in the ministry, uh, I've retired once. I thought I was going to retire a second time, but it doesn't look like that's going to happen. I'd like for you to pray for the new pastors that come into our district. I mean, yeah, they have to deal with me, but uh, pray for them that we'll be able to uh, share with them and give them uh, what they need. To the point, when you ask a question, you can get all kinds of answers. Some answers are exciting, some are boring, some are even embarrassing, and it depends, I guess, on whom you ask. And if you ask children questions, you will never get boring. Amen? You never get boring when you uh, ask children questions. There was a survey that asked some children some questions some years ago. And one of the questions was, how do you decide who to marry? And Alan, who was age 10, answered it this way. He said, you've got to find somebody who likes the same stuff. Like, if you like sports, she should like it that you like sports, and she should keep the chips and dip coming. <laughs> Christian, age 10, answered the same question. No person really decides before they grow up who they're going to marry. God decides it all way before, and you get to find out later who you're stuck with. <laughs> Another question was, how can you tell, how can a stranger tell if two people are married? And Derek said this, I like it. You might have to guess based on whether they seem to be yelling at the same kids. Uh, the third question was, what do you think your mom and dad have in common? And Lori, age eight, said, both don't want any more kids. <laughs> and the all-time favorite, how would you make a marriage work? Ricky, age 10, said this, tell your wife that she looks pretty even if she looks like a truck. <laughs> This question that nags us about the text of our gospel lesson in John chapter 14. If you know the circumstance, Jesus told Philip that we would do, we, the church, would do greater works than he did. Does that not raise some questions in your mind? I mean, it spawns a whole series of questions in my mind about exactly what Jesus meant by that. What kind of works, Jesus? How great? How much greater than what? Are we in for a ride that we're not equipped for? And the chief question that we really want to avoid even asking when this subject comes up is this. If that's the case, if we really are supposed to do greater works than Jesus did, where are those works? How come we're not seeing Europe? today? Well, the reason we want to avoid that question is because we're Methodists. Uh, frankly, we're reasonable people. We're refined, we're informed, and reformed. We don't get too radical in our Christianity around here. Just give me a little church on Sunday and I'll be okay. Don't stir things up too much around here. Answering this question has a problem in that it unravels this dirty little secret in the Christian family that we just as soon not talk about. In the miracles department, we're just a little stunted. 
We are the runts of the miracle litter, if you will. So as painful as it might be to roll around in that mud puddle, and as strange as it might be for a memorial Sunday, allow me a little latitude here to deal with this question today. I want to give you the short answer first, then we can deal with the how to something about that problem. How to do something about that problem. The short answer is this. Why is it, and that includes anybody in the Christian family, why is it that we are stunted in the miracle department? The answer, the short answer, is that we have lost sight of what God requires in order to be spiritually strong. We have placed our faith, our spiritual growth hormone, we have misplaced, we have settled for things like artificial spiritual steroids, like money, like power, like influence, like leisure time. We prefer as a church, and I'm not saying this church, I'm saying all of, them, of Christendom, we prefer the American dream to heaven's standards. In short, there's so much of the world in the church, we could get into a mud-slinging contest, and at the end of the day, we would look, look no different. We've chosen our way over his way. And on to the more sticky question, but the question that will bless us, I think, is what are we going to do about this miserable truth? That we're the runts of the miracle litter. Well, I'm glad that you asked. <laughs> the church is no different today than when Jesus established it 2,000 years ago. Heaven is still sweet. Hell is still hot. Sin is still wrong, no matter what the world says and does. And the promises of God are still true without question or change. If we're going to deal with the church's dirtiest little secret in our own lives. Why aren't there more miracles associated with Russell's life? Why is there not greater works coming from Russell's life than we saw in the life of Jesus? Let me ask you a question. Now, the way this works is I ask the question and you give an answer. Did Jesus ever lie? Yeah. Okay. This means yes, this means no. Okay. Did Jesus ever lie? No. Yeah. Was Jesus an idiot? No. Get warm here. Okay. If he didn't lie and he really knew what he was talking about, why, why don't we see the greater works? Does that disturb you? It disturbs me. It disturbs me about it in my own life. The one thing that sets people apart, or should, Christian people, believers, from those who reject Christ is peace. This is a remedy. If we're going to do something about this, the one word answer is peace. Peace should set us apart from those who reject Christ. Genuine, heaven-sent, soul-cleansing, life-altering peace. Listen, where I come from, that's not a bad little bit of medicine. Peace. Unfortunately, peace is probably the best-kept secret in the Christian world. It's also the least experience of the fruit of the Spirit. As a rule, most believers do not experience peace the way Jesus said we would. We don't live in it. We certainly don't exhibit it to the world at large. What is our reputation in the world at large as far as Christian and Christian attitude and, and, and our Christian personality? What does the world see? What do you hear in the media? You hear that we are uptight, we're condemning, we're fighting people. We want to, you know, we're harsh to everybody else and it's our way or the highway. And mostly we're as sour as an unripe person. That doesn't make your mouth pucker, you don't notice. Uh, that's our reputation. We are stunted in God's miracle department because even though we have declared ourselves as disciples of the Prince of Peace, it sounds empty when we say it. It's a dirty little Christian secret indeed. Now, I want you to do something with me. I want you to take a deep breath and let it out. Go ahead, the person in front of you will fall over. Take a deep breath. It is, 
because there's not all bad news here this morning. You're not in for a tongue lashing. Virginia, there is an open door to what Apostle Paul called the peace that passes understanding. Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. I want us to use the acrostic peace this morning. That, that word, P-E-A-C-E, -E, as an acrostic, an aid to help us understand and discover help for growing strong, growing out of that spiritual run stage and becoming strong warriors of faith, clothed in uh, the kind of peaceable fruit that we're looking for. So, with our minds bent towards John chapter 14, and that whole exchange between Jesus and his disciples, and in particular Philip, let us see what the letters in this word peace tell us to do about growing strong as believers. We do the greater works that Jesus said we would do. If you're ready, let's dig in. Uh, we're already dug in on the screen. The first letter, P, stands for parting with unbelief. Putting unbelief aside. And it's verses 8 through 14. I think all we've got on there is 8 through about uh, uh, 12. Uh, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and we'll be satisfied. Jesus replied, have I been with you all this time, Philip? And yet you still don't know who I am. Anyone who's seen me has seen the Father, so why are you asking me to show him to you? Don't you believe that I'm in the Father and the Father in me? The words I speak are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does His work through me. Just believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe because of the work you've seen me do. I tell you the truth. Here He is. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I've done and even greater works. And when Jesus said anyone, who do you suppose He was talking about? Anyone means anyone at all. If you believe in Him, if you trust in Him and you rely on Him, you cling to Him, you trust Him for salvation. The word believe shows up four times in these seven verses. Strong encouragement to give your life to Jesus Christ. Philip had a question for the Lord. You know, you know, I understand all this stuff that you said, but just show us the Father. Point us to the Father, Jesus. That will be enough to satisfy us. Now, doesn't that seem reasonable on the surface? It seems like a doesn't seem like a bad request. Old Philip just wanted to have a little vision of God, a theophany to bolster his faith for the tough job that he knew was ahead. We pray that, don't we? We say, Lord, give us a what do you pray? When we're a baby in Christ, you say, I don't know which way to turn. Lord, give me a give me a sign. Give me. Let something happen so I'll know, and I'll know that I know, and it's and it's for sure. <coughs> Philip wanted visions and signs, and Jesus wanted him to use his faith. Jesus answered to Philip, "I've been with you all this time; you still don't know me." That was a rebuke. He stopped Philip dead in his tracks. It seemed like Philip was asking a good question. I want to see the Father. Can you do that for me, Jesus? It seemed like the Lord was losing patience here, but that's just the point. Philip had had a front row pew for three and a half years and seen all the stuff that Jesus did. He should have known. He should have had deeper faith by that point. Even the blind man that Jesus healed knew that Jesus was the Messiah. Philip wanted visions and signs. Jesus said, use your faith, Philip. He had the same problem with the religious leaders. Remember the Sadducees and Pharisees came to him. It's recorded in Mark's, uh, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 12. And they said, Jesus, we want to see a sign from you. What did Jesus say? You folks are an evil and adulterous generation. You want a sign, you're not going to get it from me, except for the sign of Jonah. What was he talking about? How many days was Jonah in the belly of the whale or the fish? That's the answer. Three days. How many days was Jesus in the grave? Three days. That was the sign that Jesus was talking about. That's the only sign you're going to get. And listen, God gives us what we need. So if the only sign we're going to get is the resurrection from the dead, that's the only sign we need. To part with our unbelief means that we can't be like those folks that you know that are always just waiting for the Lord to give them a sign. Just a little miracle, please, Lord, so I can do what you want, dear God. The trouble with most people who say those types of statements is that they don't even do the basics of what the Lord has been very clear about 
extremely clear about to everybody. Consistent worship, bringing the tithe of our income to the church, sharing our faith, living a good life, a life full of goodness. They say they want a sign so they can follow, but they're just hiding the fact that they're unbelief. They have no intention of following God. It just sounds good to say. God, give me a sign. Sounds spiritual, doesn't it? Sounds spiritual anyway. Did Philip want a sign because he had a little bit of faith and he wanted it to grow? No. Actually, Philip had the opposite of faith. He had unbelief at that point. He told Jesus he'd be satisfied with seeing God. Just please, Jesus, do a little miracle. Show me God. Friends, we don't even do that in the natural world, do we? How many of you drove to worship here this morning? Did you drive to car to worship this morning? Did you obey the speed? All right, I won't go there. But hopefully you did that. Why? Well, it's because that's the law of the land, and you obey the law of the land, right? Um, you didn't manipulate the stock market this week because you're an American citizen. You know that's not right. You pay your taxes because you know that's the right thing to do. Yet, you've never met the president or the speaker of the house. You just obey the law of the land on faith that the law of the land still works. I got a nice letter from the government in 1966. It said, greetings. Next thing I know, they uh, put me on a train for an army post in South Carolina. They put green baggy clothes on me and put a rifle in my hand and a hard hat on my head. Then they sent me to Southeast Asia. <laughs> so I went. I didn't ask for a meeting with President Lyndon Johnson to find out if the words were actually valid, to check on it. I didn't need a little sign. I had my letter. Christians should be at least that willing to exercise faith towards the living God. So the letter P stands for parting with unbelief. If you want to see the kind of miracles that will bless this world and turn around our culture for God, part with the unbelief that stunts your faith. That leads us to the next letter in peace. After the P comes E, which is to engage biblical obedience. Verse 15, this one is really tough to figure out, so stay with me. Jesus said, if you love me, obey my commandments. Well, it's really difficult. I mean, does anybody not understand that? From the smallest child to the oldest saint, obey my commandments. To obey in the language of the Bible is to guard. It carries the picture of keeping an eye on something. You have that old expression uh, in golf, in baseball. If you want to hit the ball, keep your eye on the ball. And that fits very well here. We want to keep our eye on this ball of Christ's commandments. For more than watching, we want to observe, we want to perform, we want to obey. And then the A in our acrostic is accept the filling of the Spirit. We uh, part with our unbelief and we engage in biblical obedience. Now those things are like handy glove, they run together. What is accepting the filling of the Spirit? We find out verses 16 and 17. I will ask the Father, Jesus said, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He's the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world can't receive Him because it isn't looking for Him and doesn't recognize Him. But you know Him because He lives with you now and later He will be in you. See, when the Advocate is, a, is the Comforter, it's God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost if you're a King James person. When, when a person confesses Christ as Savior, the Spirit of God takes up residence in the life of that believer. The Greek word for spirit is parakletos. Para meaning uh, alongside. Kletos meaning call. The Holy Spirit is one who is called to walk alongside us in our journey in life and help us, to strengthen us, to encourage us. Years ago, we moved into a parsonage uh, and I discovered that cable TV had not ventured all the way out to Bethany Church Road up in Randleman. I mean... It was, it was a terrible thing not to have cable TV. My choices came down to two. I could either have rabbit ears and tinfoil, or I could get the dish. Uh, you know, the, the dish would bring three million channels, probably only two of them are worthwhile, you know. But, uh, you know, I opted for the dish, go figure. But at any rate, when the guy came, on the day the dish man hooked up the things, he put the receiver on the roof, and inside there were boxes and wires everywhere. I would asked my friends how to use all that stuff. The connection here with spiritual life is illustrated by the fact that when I turned on the TV with a dish 
hooked up and everything, nothing worked. I tried all the channels and I got nothing. And then I asked the dish guy, I said, help. And he got back up on the roof and he turned the receiver to the satellite in the sky and voila, Barney and friends on my little screen inside the parsonage. Wonderful. Jesus told Philip that the Holy Spirit was going to guide him and all the believers into truth. But those who preferred worldly ways, those who preferred this world's ways, would never understand. They'd have no reception. They'd have no signal from above. That's true today. John's Gospel tells us that Jesus came to His own, but His own received Him not. No signal. No recognition. They couldn't see Him now in the world, and those who side with the world, they don't have any better reception of Jesus now. In a world of incredible technology, and even spiritual technology, they still have spiritual radiators <coughs> in the tinfoil. But for anybody who will, if we stay tuned to God's signal by parting with unbelief, placing our faith in Jesus, engaging obedience to the Word, the Spirit of God will continually fill us Walk alongside of us, encourage us, strengthen us, and guide us in our daily living. Every day you become more like Christ, more a vessel of God's hand, doing works and even greater works as Jesus predicted. We've got three so far out of the five. P, part with unbelief. E, encourage, engage biblical obedience. A, accept the filling of the Spirit. And C, is cultivate spiritual understanding. Verses 25 and 26. Jesus said to his disciples, I'm telling you these things now while I'm still with you, but when the Father sends the Advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, He will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. Cultivating spiritual understanding is a matter of cooperating with God's Spirit by, listen, by taking in his instruction. We do that by reading His Word and studying it. We do it by what Mr. Wesley called holy conversation, which is simply sharing the things of Christ with others. A friend of mine used to say, it's one beggar telling another beggar where the bread is found. And that's what we do with each other. When God reveals something to me about living a life that pleases God, I can't wait to share it with others. Why? Because that's how it happens. The exchange of information. Call it a holy network, if you will. Just like a satellite dish can lose its frequency because of a storm or power outage or improper grounding, there are things in this life that work against the reception of God's instruction and understanding. Now listen, I've just taken 10 minutes to give you something I could say in one sentence. Try not to hold it against me. I'm a preacher. That's what we do. But here's the one sentence. You cannot live in sin and think you're ever going to hear God's voice. You cannot live in sin and hear the voice of God. It's like being out of sync with that satellite in the sky. You're not going to have reception. Sin will be in the way. Sunday school, small group studies, meetings, these are indispensable for not being above edges off of your spiritual tuning. Just like a satellite dish can lose its frequency, sin will blunt the voice of God in your life. You need to cultivate spiritual understanding. And finally, we need to not only do all those other things, B-E-A-C, the last one that remains is the E, and that is to embrace spiritual courage. You know, it's one thing to know how to get something done. Another thing is to have the courage to actually do it. Verse 27, Jesus said to his disciples, I'm leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So, Jesus says, don't be, what? Troubled. It's the same way he began this chapter. Be not troubled. Neither let your heart be afraid. Why? Because he's overcome the world. He knows what you need. Troubled is a word that describes the agitation of a worried soul. Jesus ends this chapter the way it started. Don't be troubled in your heart. Don't be afraid. 
And in doing this, in this 14th chapter of John, he covers the two biggest fears that anybody encounters in all their life. No, it's not the tax bill. No, it's not what that uh, that noise in your car when you, when you go down the road. It's none of those things. What are the two biggest fears? The unknown and death itself. What is Jesus doing? He's saying, take this thing out of it because it doesn't belong there. Don't be troubled. Don't be afraid. He said, I have overcome the world. Don't be troubled. Don't be afraid. Consider what Jesus is saying here. He's saying, don't be timid about your life. Don't be troubled. Don't let the unknown future unhinge you. Don't let death scare you. I give you peace to conquer anything you face. So what I want to do as we prepare to go out to the cemetery this morning is to show you a brief comparison between what Jesus offers and what the world offers. Think about these things. The world offers us material things, does it not? You all live in a car, that's a material thing. You live somewhere, that's a material thing. You may get a salary, you may get uh, food on your plate. The world offers material things, physical powers, political solutions. What does Jesus offer? He offers forgiveness, and he offers eternal life. The world offers for those material things warranties to protect for five or 10 or 20 years against mechanical failure or defects. It offers you insurance for paying hospital bills and government protections against the bad guy. Jesus offers eternal life without spot or wrinkle. The world offers freedom to do it your way and space to go along. Jesus offers his unending love and his friendship so that you don't have to go alone. His own spirit dwells in your soul. Peace that passes all understanding. In short, the world offers all the best that it has so that you can do it in your own way. And it offers you the freedom to do it without interruption. And all it leads to is an absence of peace, a rise in Valium, a rise in Prozac. Because we've chosen our own strength and we put aside his power. The secret to peace is to embrace spiritual courage. Place it all at the foot of the cross and trust Jesus with our lives. Not just a little church on Sunday, but a genuine transferring of the helm of our life over oh, which the Lord has come. It's a daily surrender to His Lordship. So here are my choices. Biblical choices that lead me into all peace that passes understanding. Part with my unbelief. I want to live in faith. Engage in obedience to His Word. Biblical authority over my life. Accepting the filling of the Spirit, that strange warmth, like Mr. Wesley described 250 years ago. Cultivating spiritual understanding, learning His way for my life. And embracing spiritual courage, stepping out into His strength for me. I'm going to close with a question here. When you go to the ER, where you go to the urgent care, what is the first thing that they ask you? Somebody says, insurance card, please, I'll hit you with it. Now, what, what, what does the nurse ask you about you? She says, on a scale of 1 to 10, what is your pain like today, right? In the same way, let me be Nurse Russell this morning. You have a peace meter inside of you, and you know whether it's on empty or whether it's on full. You know if you're distracted, you know if you're in trouble, you know if life is making you come unglued or not. And that's pretty easy to do in this neighborhood, in this day and age where we live, with all the stuff that goes on. See on the screen that little peace meter, where is yours? Is it on empty? Is it on full? Is it not quite where it needs to be? We can't make that change. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the promise of peace from our Lord Jesus Christ, who said if we will embrace courage in him, engage biblical obedience and authority over our life, accept the filling of your spirit. Lord, if we
good, simply part with our unbelief and trust it all to you. Our peace will be passing every bit of understanding. Nobody will understand what's going on in our life. We wouldn't be able to understand during hard times whether there's a smile on our face and why we seem to have peace when everybody else is falling apart. Father, help it to be so in the strong name of Jesus that we take up peace. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen.